want to encourage you, if you will, after, after this week and, and uh, seeing the honesty and the and the sincerity uh, in the members here, uh, asking the questions that we have and, and, and talking about the things we've talked about. Tomorrow I'd like to encourage you to bring a notepad. And instead of doing the sermon I was going to do tomorrow night, which is this one, we're going to look at the, uh, I'm going to bring the board up here, and what we're going to do is to uh, uh, go through some things that are hard to understand about having a home Bible study. And we're going to go through basically what I would teach somebody if I were to do a home Bible study. And I use a lot of notebook paper, things, because when people can see things, a lot of people are visual. And uh, it makes more sense to them. So tomorrow night, that's what we're going to look at. Some things that are hard to understand about a home Bible study, but we're going to make it not so hard to understand. And I hope you'll be encouraged by that, that you will then go out and hold about eight or ten Bible studies a week. Well, every night anyway. And we'll go from there. First of all, some things that are hard to understand about taking a stand. I mean by taking a stand. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. That means a gird is a belt. You know, they used to, when they had the long robes, when they got ready to go into battle, they would reach down and pull those robes, if my understanding, and they would tuck them in to a belt. And that they would be belted up, and they would be like uh, the, the old uh, pantaloon <laughs> type look. And that way they could fight and run, and it wouldn't uh, drag on the ground. So it's having put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. We can see here, as I've got in the red there, that it's hard for us to understand that we are trying to defeat an enemy we can't see. What does Satan look like? Hell, he don't let everybody knows, right? He's red. He's got a red suit, long red pointy tail, and pitchfork, and horns, and usually a goatee. Oh, sorry. I grew a goatee once. My, my wife said, you look like, what did you say, Charles Manson? Yeah, so we went... Full beard, full beard. There you go, let's go full beard. Uh, and I, I'm not allowed to grow it as long as I'd like to. Uh, in being in food service, I have to keep it short like this. Otherwise, I told somebody that I'd have to grow it down here and put beads in it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now we're starting to get something. See, we find, he said, the power of darkness. It's a spiritual battle in heavenly places. Things going on that we don't know about right now. There are things going on between the Lord, between Satan, between angels. All things that we don't understand. When was the last time you saw Satan? Well, you see him all over the place. You probably saw him on your TV the other day. He may have been drinking. May have had on a little pair of short shorts. May have been pornography. May have been... On a ball court, may have been hearing somebody cuss. Satan's all over. Why is he all over? Look what it says. Second Corinthians 11, and no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his helpers, his servants, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. We have to understand something. I used to be able to do this with the billboards. You can't do this anymore, and it's a good thing. 
But I used to be able to say Satan looks like a uh, the Marlboro man riding on a hog, horse, tall, good-looking man riding on a big, tall horse. That's Satan when you see him. Satan comes in many forms. We don't have that anymore. That's a good thing. Satan comes in a lot of forms. And if you're, and if you're trying to understand Satan as, as somebody you can see, taste, touch, feel, that's just like trying to think about Jesus like that. When was the last time you saw Jesus? Please don't hold up your hand. You haven't seen Jesus personally, but Jesus is a spirit being, isn't he? God is spirit, right? They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, right? And so we are battling an enemy that we don't understand. And a lot of times we lose that battle, don't we? And we lose that battle because we have to remember he has ministers. He has servants. That, that friend that's trying to drag you off into something you know you shouldn't be doing. That person at work that is telling the dirty jokes and trying to get you to listen to them. These are all, when they're participating in those kind of things, they're all servants of Satan. Why? Because it's sin that they're committing. Let's continue. We need to understand that our enemy is powerful. I don't know how many of you have had sins in your life you're trying to defeat. You know, every person, that just about every person, now it's a random statement. This is some Fredism here, so don't write it down. But my guess is that everybody in here has some sin you're dealing with. It's a sin that you're trying to defeat. Whether it's something you listen to, some place you go, something you do, something you wear, something you watch, something you say, and you're dealing with it. My heart of sin just about to quit when I became a Christian was cussing. As I told you before, I wasn't brought up in a Christian family. My dad owned a construction company. Needless to say, I had a really bad mouth. Now you couldn't get me to say a cuss word if you paid me a million dollars for it. Doesn't matter how bad I stubbed my toe or whatever. It comes your time, right? comes through Jesus, comes through a realization that he's there to help you through these things that your heavenly father will bring you best. But, but most of us have at least a sin that we work on, whatever it is. And did you ever notice about the time you think you've got it conquered, what happens? Comes back again, doesn't it? Comes back around. Comes back to find you. Well, how's that happen? First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, your enemy, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, it's often been said, and I think it's probably true, when you see a pack of lions, you're watching one of these uh, uh, shows on TV about the wilderness, you know. You see the lions, they'll almost always attack the weakest, the slowest, the smallest, the youngest. The one that can't really get away, the crippled one. And that's the one they attack because they're easy prey. What I want to encourage you tonight more than anything is I hope be, by the time we're at the end of this sermon, I hope you have found a way not to be an easy prey for Satan. Because he has one mission. Can you imagine your one mission in existence? And you've been existing before the creation because it says that the angels were there and sang and shouted at the creation. And can you imagine for all this time that the earth has been standing? Remember Adam and Eve, how that worked out? Can you imagine that your one lot in life is to steal somebody's soul? and condemn it eternally to hell. Can you imagine? That that's what you live for, that that's what you do, that you have so much hatred and so much evil in your heart. Can you imagine being that person that just tries to get somebody to stumble and fall? Well, that's Satan. But you see, you can't see him, but he does have ministers, and we have to remember that. Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18. 
Not only is he like a roaring lion, and I will deliver you from the Jewish people, he says, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them, watch this, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The power of Satan. Darkness. Satan is a dark individual. You know there's some dark things in our lives. There's some dark television programs, aren't there? They're just dark. They're just dark. I mean, you, you're, there's just no... No goodness in them. That's not necessarily anything that's our rated or whatever. I'm just talking about some dark shows. I know some of you are old enough to remember it. Most of you may not. I'm getting on up there a little bit. There's a show called Dark Shadows at Barnabas Collins. He was a vampire. That's darkness right there. That's something dark. You think about that. Witchcraft. Things like that. Dark. Dark stuff. Who's a, who is the engineer of those things? Who is the dark, the dark one and the power of Satan? Well, that's his followers, Satan himself. And we get involved in dark things. Look at this. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. This is what happens to you when you become a Christian. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We've seen he's like a roaring lion. It says the power of Satan, the power of darkness. You got you starting to get the word here? The word is power. We sing there's power what? In the blood. That's what the Christian is holding to. That's what we understand. That's what we believe. But what you have to understand is on this side over here, there's a power of darkness. And it's Satan. And there's a battle going on. And if I were to ask you this, who do you think in this world is winning this battle? It's a pretty simple, isn't it? It's Satan. It's Satan. He's a prince of this world, he says. Look what it says in Ephesians 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, a spiritual being, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's those ministers or servants. Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Darkness, power, air, spirit being. Do you know why it's so hard for us to win this battle sometimes, it seems? Now, what I'm hoping tonight is that you won't, you'll understand, I guess. Don't get discouraged when you sin. I'm afraid. I'm afraid maybe sometimes we present things in such a way that makes you believe that you'll never enter through the gates of heaven unless you're almost spit, shine, perfect. That you're just about a pristine individual, almost, uh, if it were to be right, like a monk or something like that. You know, like you just a hermit for the Lord, and uh, you never sin, you never get out, you never do anything. I'm going to tell you what, folks. We're all sinners in here. Now, you may not have realized it, even me. We're all sinners in here. What you need to be tonight is a saved sinner, though, right? Amen? You need to be a saved sinner. What's the difference in a sinner and a saved sinner? A saved sinner is somebody who's striving to follow Jesus Christ. The power and prince of the power of darkness and prince of the air, that lion that goes about seeking to devour us, you're that person who says, no, I'm, I'm going to cling to Christ. Now, I make my mistakes. I commit my sins. Difference in mistakes and sins, by the way. Mistakes, something happened accidentally. Sin, something you do. Sin's a choice. Mistakes, sometimes we can't help. But, but what I don't want you to do is get discouraged. I don't want you to think this just too hard. 
There's too much to this. I have too much against me on this. I'm too, I'm too dirty. I'm too bad. I'm too rotten. I'm too evil. I'll never be able to do this. My Uncle Charlie, for the longest time, would not get baptized. And he continued to say the reason was because he wasn't sure yet that he was able to be what he should be. How many times have you heard that from somebody, right? I just don't know that I'm ready. I don't know that I, I'll be able to be what I should be, and I don't want to fail. Well, the biggest failure of all is if you leave this place lost. That's the biggest failure of all. Live your whole life. Enjoy yourself. Have a good job, a good home, good family. Have fun. Have money put back. Take vacations. Whatever the case is and die lost. You've lost it all. You lived for absolutely nothing and ended up getting the wages you didn't want, the wages of sin, which is spiritual death and eternal damnation. Satan is a real piece of work. You need to understand that Satan is able to offer everything that the Christian can. This is the hard part. This is the hard part when we're trying to defeat Satan. This is the hard part when we're trying to get people to obey the gospel and stay faithful and things along this line. It's difficult. Because Satan has everything to offer. You know, I'm going to tell you something. We have, and I'll just be honest with you about it. We have brethren who feel that if you offer a fellowship hall, if you offer a place to eat, if you offer Easter egg hunts and trunk or treat and fall festivals and place to have showers and weddings and birthday parties, and you take church paid expense, uh, 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 tours to wherever and have pizza parties that the Lord pays for. And all things such as this, that, that that's the way it is to go. Who wouldn't want that, right? If we could find authority for it in the scriptures, who wouldn't want that? Brandon, you'd put you all in fellowship hall in immediately if it were authorized, right? I don't know, maybe you wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> Gonna be all conservative on me over here. And why wouldn't we do that if it were authorized? But you see, it just doesn't go our way a lot of times. And Satan has so much to offer. Look at this, John eight forty four. You are the father of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Adam and Eve, what, they, what happened to him? The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. They did. They began dying physically. They died spiritually. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. You see that? It gets back to our sermon, doesn't it? He doesn't stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a lie and the father of it. I'm going to tell you what. Satan will lie to you. Satan will tell you it's okay to hang around. Young people in here. Satan will tell you it's okay to hang around those people you know are a little shady. A little sketchy. Because you're going to convert them. So you're going to run with them and hang with them. He will convince you that it's okay to go to that party. There's drinking there, but you know what you're going to do? You're going to be that person who doesn't drink. You're going to, you're going to be that stalwart force at that party, and you're going to show them that you can be a Christian, and they're going to be drinking, but you're not going to be the one drinking. You're going to have a Coca-Cola, and you're just going to show them what it means to be a Christian. You think I'm just blowing smoke here? I hear this stuff all the time from kids. Teenagers, older teenagers, younger teenagers, adults. Why do you keep hanging around such so you know you get into it? Well, I just keep hoping that maybe I can convert him. Ladies, let me tell you something. If you're dating somebody 
that is not a Christian, somebody who's not acting like a Christian right now, if you think you're going to change that individual after you marry him, you're out of your mind. It's very unlikely. Now, somebody in the audience is probably going, well, it happened with me. <laughs> mine changed. Mine was baptized. Man, that's like saying, well, my friend was saved, had, didn't have a seatbelt on. If he'd have had it on, he'd have drowned. Therefore, <laughs> don't wear seatbelts. Of course, it's one out of a thousand is the ratio on that. You realize that, right, as far as it helping you and not helping you. I used to teach driving. And what happens to us is Satan lies. And you know who buys it? We do. We buy it. We can go there and be okay. I had to leave a fairly lucrative job in Alabama because it was going to continue to cause me to be involved in drinking parties. Now, I didn't have to drink. I was a manager. All I had to do was hang around to make sure that my workers didn't get too drunk and tear the place up. We talked about that, and I was down there one night. Blenda said, this is wrong. Something is wrong with this. She said, I'm going to the room. Well, when Mama goes to the room, you better go to the room, too. <laughs> and I had to quit that job. When I went to that job, the district manager, division manager, told me. I said, I don't want to be around any drinking. And I knew they went to the beach a lot. I said, I don't want to go to the beach and see all these other women running around in their bikinis. I won't have a part in any of that. I'm a Christian. He said, I got you. It's not a problem. Got me down there. Took the depot from number seven to number one in one year. First party we went to, they broke out the Jack Daniels. Went down from there. Let me tell you something. Satan will lie to you. And if it feels bad, go with your gut feeling. If it feels like it not, might not be quite right, if something looks like it's not quite what it should be, take it that it's not what it should be. Get away from it. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you, but you know it also says flee fornication. There's a time to stand and fight and there's a time to run. Sometimes it's not cowardly to run from Satan when he's got the upper hand. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We, we have to realize it lies. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, little g God of this age, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. I'm doing all I can here to help you understand something that I can't even begin to touch. And I just hope I make some kind of an impact tonight. I can't hold the devil up here and show you what he looks like. I can't help you understand what all he's doing to try and steal your soul. All I can do is give you some advice from the scriptures on what not to do and what to look out for. If somebody looks dark, if somebody looks evil, if somebody is trying to encourage you to do that which is wrong, if it feels wrong, it's probably wrong. Don't participate in it. But friends, I'm going to tell you what. You know, we average, the Bible says, 70 to 80 years. Some live longer than that. we got a 91-year-old brother just had a sister that I buried at 101 years old. Well, this life is short. <laughs> you don't believe it, talk to somebody who's 75, 80 years old. Ask them how short life is. Ask them if it doesn't feel like just yesterday they were a teenager and that time has flown by. This life's short. You need to make the best of it. Because when you leave here, that's all you got. John 2, verse 16. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's just sort of every sin in a nutshell, is not 
of the Father, but is of the world. Uh, Satan's the God of this world. Did you realize, you know, we think Jesus is the, don't we? We think God's the God of this world. Look, God has made whatever provisions to allow Satan, just like he was with Job, to allow Satan a certain amount of leeway. And God does that to prove us as to whether or not we're going to be faithful to him. And if we fail that test, friends, it's a test you don't. You can fail a lot of tests, young people. <laughs> and you, your mom and dad may not be happy about it. Your teacher may not happy, be happy about it. But if you fail this test, there's no makeup test. There are no do-overs. It's important that you pass this test. It's hard to understand that even if you have to stand alone, you need to stand. Friends, there are going to be times when you're the only person in the room that can stand. That can happen among members of the church. You can be the only member of the church in a, in a, a discussion <clears throat> who's taking a stand for what's right. Stand. Don't be moved. I love the song, I Shall Not Be Moved. I'm going to tell you what. Sometimes it's tough. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast. Plant your feet. Don't back up. Don't back down, right? Don't back down. There's a time to take a stand. You're going to offend people. You're going to offend people in the world. You may even offend some brothers and sisters. Don't back up. If you know it's the truth, you plant your feet. Don't let anybody blow you off it. Don't let pressure. I'm going to tell you what. You'd be surprised the pressure that evangelists face. Correct? You'd be surprised the pressure evangelists face to give in to error that comes sweeping through the Lord's church. The only error is not institutionalism or the AD 70 theory or something like this. There are sound brethren who have gone off on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. This mental divorce idea that you can put away your mate not for fornication as long as she... She and the seven children, of course, you have to have a lot of kids involved in this when you explain it, so there's that factor. And she has seven children, and the husband leaves her, puts her away, not for fornication. She says, oh, please, please don't divorce me. I don't want this divorce, and he does it anyway. What's that make her? Makes her the put-away person of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 is exactly what it makes her. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32, it's exactly what it makes her as the put away person. And then some brethren that were near and dear to my heart that I no longer am able to consider faithful. They turn around then and said, that put away woman may now two years down the line when he finds him and sweet little honey out here and he takes up with her that she can now mentally put him away for fornication and remarry. Let me tell you what that's called. It's called error. It's exactly what that's called. And some of you may not even remember the split that has been caused among the conservative brethren over that one issue. It split us wide open. I lost $1,700 a month in support overnight. By taking a stand against that. Take a stand. God will. We sing the song, don't we? God will take care of you. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God will take care of you. Amen? If you take a stand, he'll take care of you. You start backing up, you're not worth your salt. God can't use you. Take a stand. Be strong. Even if you're the only one standing Philippians chapter 4, verse... Hello, let's get back where we were. Philippians chapter 4. You like that? That's what's coming out. That's a pretty sharp one. Philippians 4, verse 1 and verse 13. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do we make that stand? It's through the strength brought on to us through Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to take a stand. A wishy-washy child of God is somebody who's miserable. You come and you worship and you're here and you give yourself to the to the praise and you give your money and you take the Lord's Supper and you sing and do whatever, but you won't stand for anything. And if error creeps into the group, you won't stand against it. Maybe you don't want to offend. Maybe you don't feel comfortable. Maybe you have friends on, quote, both sides. You ever been there? In anything in life? <laughs> you got to take a stand. Young people at school, you have to take a stand. Folks at work, you have to take a stand. You have to. And that sets you apart from everybody else in that place. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. I love this passage. Be strong. You know, a lot of times people, something will happen. Somebody will lose a loved one or something. And, and on Facebook, it's you see so many, be strong. Be strong. Be strong, right? And that, a lot of times, just be strong. People, I've heard people say, I get sick and tired of people telling me to be strong. I don't want to be strong. I just lost my husband, my wife, my son, or my daughter. I'm not strong. I don't feel strong. But I'm just telling you, be strong. That's what the scripture's telling you. Look what it says. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be strong, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done. This is interesting, isn't it? With love. You can be strong, you can take a stand and still not be a jerk. <laughs> you can still not be overly aggressive or abrasive. We can blow somebody out of the water real fast by being abrasive. You can pull somebody to you by talking to them in love. Even though you are worlds apart in your beliefs, you can pull them to you. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed good confession in the presence of many witnesses. It's a fight for in, brothers and sisters. Who are you fighting? Don't know, can't see him. <laughs> Where's that lion? Can you hear him? I can't hear him roar. Can't see him. Can't smell him. Can't taste him. Can't touch him. Can't even hear him. But he can steal your soul in a heartbeat. I can't convey to you enough tonight to get you to understand Satan. I'm working on it myself. I can see what the scriptures tell me. They tell me who he is and what he has going on. But it's so hard to define who he is. But here again, remember, I guess what we have more than anything, he has servants here on earth, okay? It's not some weird, you know, <laughs> ghost-like thing. He has servants here on earth who are doing his bidding. They're on the television. They're on the radio. They're at school with you. They're at work with you. They may be in the church with you. And he uses anybody and everybody he can to steal your soul. Why don't you turn to the book of First Kings with me? First Kings. We're almost done, believe it or not. Don't get all shaky and smile and start putting your cloak and coat on and all that stuff. We ain't that done. First Corinthians 19. Old Elijah. Elijah has just worn out the prophets of Baal. He's shown who God is. God, it's so funny. Elijah said, well, maybe they were going to call down fire and burn up the offer. And they just, oh, they cut themselves. And Elijah kept checking on them. What's the, how's it going? How you, how you coming there? Oh, they cut their flesh and they did this and that. Elijah said, well, maybe maybe your God's asleep. I mean, maybe he's asleep. Oh, maybe, basically, more or less, he said, maybe he went into a bar. He took, maybe he's on vacation. And, and, the prophets of Baal lost the battle and were put to death. And there was a very, very wicked lady named Jezebel married to King Ahab. And Jezebel was ruthless. And she hated Elijah. Chapter 19. 
And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. In other words, Elijah, by tomorrow, son, you'll be dead. I'm going to kill you before, before you see the sunrise. Watch what happens with Elijah, the faithful and strong preacher. Verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Just got done slaying 450 prophets of Baal. She says, I'm getting ready to kill you. And he says, I'm out of here. But it's not the fact that he, how many of us wouldn't have left, right? I mean, I'd have probably headed out of town, wouldn't you? But that's not the part that we need to notice about Elijah. Here's why I'm preaching what I am to you tonight. Verse 3, And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I'm going to tell you what, folks. Brothers and sisters, look up here and think about this for just a minute. You can get discouraged trying to follow Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Have you ever felt it? Have you ever felt that discouragement when you felt like you just couldn't own up to what God expects of you? To where you just... You just feel like I'm just not good enough. I'm just not doing well at this. And when you get to feeling that way, this place here, coming here, gets to be a challenge. Living righteously out there gets to be almost impossible. And Elijah said, I'm done. That's it. I'm done. I'm tired of this. I can't handle this anymore. Verse 5, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. An angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. angel knew he was going on a journey. He didn't. The angel did. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days. You know God had something to do with that. And 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. Watch this. And I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Have you ever felt like the only one taking a stand in a situation? Young people at school, have you ever felt like you're the only one not doing what the other ones are doing? It's miserable, isn't it? As an adult, have you ever felt that way at work or around other people? That didn't feel good at all. Ouch. She didn't push us. Have you ever been the only one taking a stand? And you and you you had to take a stand, and then you thought, I just can't do this. And you let yourself down. And you let God down. And you let your Lord and Savior down. And guess who won? That's right. That power of darkness, fella. The prince of the power of the air. The God of this world. He won, didn't he? Look what happens. Continue. Let me see what I've got here. Okay. Let me do this. 
Then he said, go out, verse 11, and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, I love this. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, why are you still hanging around? What are you doing here? Some think he means, why did you get, how did you get here? What? I think he's simply saying, why are you still here? You saw the earthquake. You saw the fire. You said, I fed you and you went 40 days. Don't you understand I'm with you? I'm on your side. I'm there for you. Verse 14, and he said, I've been very zealous for the God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. He tells him the exact same thing he told him before. Tore down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I want you to think about this. Elijah says, God, I don't know why this is happening to me. I've been faithful. I've been zealous. I took a stand against the false prophets. I, I've been with you all the way. But now God, look what he says. He says in verse 14, I alone am left. Why am I still here, God? Because they seek to take my life. What had happened here? What had happened? He said, God, I've done everything you asked me to do. I've been that faithful brother and sister. I'm there every time the door's open. I give sometimes more than I can actually afford to give. I help in the service of the Lord. I, I clean the building. I teach a class. I sing as loud as I can. I just enjoy. I, I, I greet all the visitors. I go around and make sure everybody's okay. I take food to the, to the uh, ones who are sick, and I do all these things. And Lord... Still doesn't seem to be going my way. We ever feel like that? Like we've given everything to God, but what? You just can't see where he's giving anything back. And that's where Elijah was. <coughs> Elijah had gotten discouraged. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. It's easy to get discouraged serving the Lord. Did you realize that? This is not an easy business right here being a Christian. It's not easy. If anybody could do it, we'd have this place full. You'd have to build on it. would be thousands of people in here if it were easy and it were, quote, fun all the time and everything just went your way. But that's not what it's like. Why? Because you're fighting. You're fighting daily with the prince of the power of the air, with the power of darkness. You can't see your enemy. And he's on you. And he's putting his servants out there to cause you to fall. <coughs> and it's a constant, what do you call it? A fight, didn't he? It's a constant fight. Watch this. Verse 15, And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Watch this. This is where I'm going to leave you tonight. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Amen. Folks, there are other people in this battle with you. You're not alone. It may feel like you are sometimes. 
It may feel like you're the only one trying. We get discouraged. We get disappointed. It seems like we try our best. Did you ever notice when you try and do your best for God? How many of you have ever, just think about this, had somebody converted, a new convert, and as soon as they come up out of the water, they go out to start their car and the battery blows up. Then on the way home, they finally get somebody that swaps them out of battery. On the way home, they have a blowout. This happened to a four, four, we baptized a man just a while back, and this is exactly what happened to him. Things along this line, the truck kept breaking down, so I said, I've got a car I can loan you. And I loaned him my Suburban that I just knew was an unbelievable piece of work, my 1998 Suburban. Keeps rocking right on down. I said, oh, thank you, man, on the way home. <laughs> Had a blowout. The car that he just, this guy just been baptized. And you know what the feeling is? <coughs> Seems to me like it was easier before I became a Christian. How many of you have ever felt that way? It just seemed like things were easier before I got saved. I'm going to tell you what, nothing's easier before you're saved, amen? Nothing. Because what the difference is, and I think sometimes we fail on this, is we don't realize, take songbooks out, we're about done if you take songbooks out, otherwise look up here, it's a little strange. I don't know if I'm in the picture or not anymore. Am I in the picture now? I'm in the picture. <laughs> Tie straight. Tie. And what I want you to realize is this. Folks, we're in a battle. We're in a battle, but you have help. You have 7,000, or at least 50-something, right, who have a bow the knee to bail. You're not in this by yourself. But I'm going to tell you what, if you're not a Christian, you are in this by yourself. If you need to be saved, you need to be saved tonight. That's what you need to do. You need to make that decision. Let me tell you, I've had people tell me, well, I'm just not ready. Well, I have some things to take care of. Well, I don't know if I can do this. I'm going to tell you something. It's a lot easier to take care of whatever it is you're trying to overcome in your life. It's a lot easier with God on your side. You remember the Corinthians, he said, some of you were this and that and that, some, this and that, all kinds of sins. And he said, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified. Yeah, you know, you can be what you used to be. And sometimes you may be a recovering alcoholic. Doesn't mean you're not going to drink again and need to repent and ask the church to pray with you. Had, a, had an older gentleman in Gilt Edge, Tennessee. Wonderful individual. They lived in a shed. They lived in a shed. Had newspaper all over the inside of their walls. I can remember going over to visit the sweetest people. And they'd sit on the couch and they had an old pot belly stove. And during the winter they had a stove going. And they'd sit on the couch and they'd smoke. They'd, they'd flick their cigarettes, try to flick them into the fire. Just the sweetest people on earth. Basically dirt floor for the most part. His name was Glenwood. And Glenwood was a dear friend of mine. Loved him to death. Studied with him. Broke down and cried like a child. Cried like a baby when he came back to the Lord. I said, Glenwood, you lost, man. Had to study with him. You need to come back to the Lord. And he said, I'm coming back. It's about what every other week. Glenwood was up, had the same suit, one suit. Big, tall, lanky dude. When I baptized him, it was, I'm a little bit short feller. It was like baptizing King Kong. And he had that suit and he'd wear it. And you'd preach and all of a sudden you'd see Brother Glenwood coming up and sitting down in front. Say, Brother Glenwood, what is I've been drinking. I've been drinking again. I'd say, folks, let's pray for Brother Glenwood. I'm telling you, you're going to sin. You may have trouble getting over your sin, but it, you cannot get over it without Jesus Christ on your side and God in your life. Amen. Can't do it. There may be somebody in here tonight who needs to be saved, and you've been waiting. You've been holding off. You don't know why. Probably nobody in here knows why. Tonight's the night you can do that. Tonight's the night you can give your life over to Jesus Christ. Tonight, 
And I have a habit of saying this when we put somebody down in the waters of baptism. When they come up out of the water of baptism, and even I tell them before, you're getting to ready to wash away every sin you have ever committed in your life. No matter how bad, how dirty, how terrible the sin was, you're getting ready to wash it away in the blood of the Lamb. You're getting ready to be a child of the King, a child of God, washed by the blood of Jesus and saved by the grace of God. And you leave it all in the water. I told a person the other day, I said, you left so much sin in there, we may have drained that thing. So, <laughs> you don't want to go in there now, you get it all over you. You can come to Jesus tonight. Believe the word of God. I figure you probably do or you wouldn't be here tonight. Be willing to repent of your sins. What's that mean? You make a decision now. Make a decision right now that you're going to follow Jesus instead of the world, instead of Satan. There's only two choices, people. Either you're a child of God or a child of Satan. Did you understand? Did you realize that? He says you are of your, what, father, the devil. You're either a child of God at this point in your life or you are a child of Satan. There, there's no middle ground where you can be kind of, I'm okay, sort of not okay. you either his or you're Jesus. He said you can't serve two masters. Either you'll love one. Cling to that person. Or you go with the other. You can't serve them both. You hold to one. Whichever one it is you hold to. Tonight, if you want to repent of your sins, you can Stand before this group and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's not hard, is it? He is. He's the risen Son of God. He's your Savior. Let us baptize you tonight to have your sins washed away. You need to understand something. If you need to be saved and you leave through those doors, I can't promise you anything. But I can promise you one thing. If you head this direction instead of that direction, if you're lost right now, we will raise you up from the waters of baptism and you will be saved by the blood of Jesus. That's a pretty simple choice, it seems to me. Let us baptize you tonight. There's somebody who's already made that journey and you've fallen by the wayside. Maybe you've committed sins of a public nature that you can't cover just with a prayer to you and God or, or whoever the sin was around. We want to pray with you tonight and for you. Come back to Jesus. Maybe a member of the church in here right now who has for some time been needing to come back to Jesus to again renew your lives, to give your life back to the Savior. You can do that tonight. Friends, we're going to sing the invitation song, Standing on the Promises. And I promise you one thing, and he promises you, that if you put him on as your Savior, you will never, ever regret it. It will be the best life you will ever live. Won't you come while we stand?